Hello everyone and welcome to the second presentation of this four part series called the Virtual Nature Summit webinar. Uh, my name is Maddie Heredia. I'm the outreach specialist and a land manager for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, that's the entity of the agency that is putting this on this week. And with us today, we have Noor Salam. She is one of our own. Uh, she is our geoprocessing specialist, but she is also um, has holds a wealth of knowledge for um, birds, native birds in the state. And actually, I don't know why I said native because you know, <laughs> you know, birds from all over the place. Um, but today, she is going to give us a presentation about backyard bird identification and how to identify birds from calls, behaviors, and appearance. Um, so before we get into that, I am going to give you a brief overview. of who we are and what we do as an agency. Nor, can you just give me a shout out if you can see that? You're all good, you're all good to go. Awesome, so we are the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. We are an agency in, we are a state government agency and we are in the energy and an environment cabinet. So the duties of our office uh, are listed here by statute. However, I'm not gonna read all of these out to you. The gist of it is that we acquire, we purchase properties to protect them, to create recreation opportunities for the general public, um, to help maintain them and preserve rare and endangered habitat, as well as monitor and manage for rare and endangered species. And so with that being said, this is a map depicting um, all of the properties that we have involvement in across the state of Kentucky. There are several that we own and manage ourselves. Um, you can look them up on our website and how to get there, directions, trails, um, and stuff like that. And there's also several properties across the state that we have partnerships with through our programs that we administer. So there's a lot of state parks and Kentucky um, Wild, our wildlife management areas um, and properties like that, even federal lands that we have conservation easements on or have some sort of involvement in. And so in total, it's about 130,000 acres that we help manage and protect across Kentucky. So in our agency, we have a few different um, branches. Our natural areas conservation and management branch um, is tasked with making decisions based on data collected for the best management practices for a specific property um, to restore habitat, remove invasive species, um, you know, build hiking trails, um, and just help preserve rare and endangered species. Our biological assessment branch, um, their job is to go out onto newly acquired properties as well as properties that we've had for a long time to keep updating records on what is existing on the property. Um, we also have the state's leading uh, rare plant monitoring program. And lastly, we do a lot of um, environmental education um, and outdoor recreation opportunities. A lot of that unfortunately has come to a halt due to COVID-19, um, but we're getting back into the swing of things and thank goodness for technology we've been able to provide a lot of programs virtually. With all of the data that we collect, um, it goes into our Kentucky Biological Assessment Tool that is made available for the public. And so the reason that we are here today, um, some of you may know, some of you, this might be new to you, but in 2019, we started planning a um, in-person Kentucky Nature Summit at Pine Mountain State Park. And it was a three-day event with several uh, field trips, um, hands-on interactive things led by many different biologists um, from many different agencies. And unfortunately, due to COVID and cabinet restrictions and just uncertainty of what's going on and when things <laughs> will be completely back to normal, we've had to cancel 
this event. And so we didn't want to leave anyone hanging. We wanted to still provide some sort of virtual webinar series that had presentations that covered some of the topics that we were going to um, explore in this in-person event. And hopefully one day we can have it in person. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Noor and stop sharing my screen. And whenever you're ready, Noor, go ahead. Oh, and before we start, um, I should mention that in your bar, you will have a little um, question mark symbol. And if you have any questions for Noor throughout the presentation, I encourage you to go ahead and type those in and ask them. You do not have to wait to the very end. Um, at the very end, I will go ahead and ask those questions. But um, if you see something that you're interested or curious about while she's presenting, go ahead and get those questions in. So go ahead, Noor. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Maddie. And can you confirm as well that you can see my screen? I can. Yeah, sorry. Okay, awesome. <laughs> All right. Give me just a minute. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for attending. I'm so happy to be talking to you about birds today. Um, this is going to be an interactive workshop about identifying common backyard birds. I am the GIS specialist, not an ornithologist. I'm the GIS specialist for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. I love bird watching in my free time, and I've been doing this for a little while, and I've been very interested in educating um, everyone around me about it. Uh, along with being part of the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, I'm also very locally involved with the Frankfurt Audubon Society as a board member. Our mission is to educate the public about bird watching as well as conserving birds and their habitat. So um, please feel free to follow us on our uh, Facebook page to be informed about more events of this type specific to birds. Um, you can be involved by participating in the Christmas bird count, our monthly bird walks, and also our monthly educational presentations. Previous presentations have been done, uh, including the common backyard bird one I'm about to give you. We also had a presentation about woodpeckers, mimic birds, hummingbirds, and we have an upcoming one um, about swifts, swallows, and nighthawks. So those are your summer birds coming up. Um, before we really dive in, uh, let me mention that the birds we're about to talk about are the most common in Kentucky. And in addition to that, the calls and the songs we're about to learn are really the characteristic ones for those species. Birds don't make it easy on us, and there's always variation and the different sounds they can make. Um, and uh, lastly, the most exciting part is, as I mentioned, this workshop is interactive, so there will be quizzes. So be sure to type in your quiz responses in the Q&A section, which should be a little uh, question mark symbol at the top of your screen or your device. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing your uh, questions and quiz responses. So let's dive in. Before we start going every, over every single bird, I wanted to talk to you a little about general bird anatomy. Now, I'm gonna mention a lot of terms. They would be good to know. I'm not gonna necessarily use all of them. If you remember some of them, that's awesome, but don't feel like you have to remember all of them. Starting from the top, the top of the head is called the crown, and the bill, also called the beak, is right here. Following that, we have the throat. That's pretty straightforward. On the back of the head, which is equivalent to your neck, the back of your neck, that's the nape. And the upper back area is called the mantle. The lower back area is called the rump. That's a really important one. And we have, of course, the tail. And uh, coming back to the front, we have the belly and flanks. And then finally, the sides and breast. I have one more anatomy slide for you, and then that's it. Um, 
some more very uh, distinctive features are the wing bars. So as you can see in the arrow on the slide, those are the little lines, the little white lines going uh, horizontally on a bird's wing. Some birds have them, some birds don't, which is why this is a really good uh, ID feature to look for, especially when you're looking at sparrows. We have the lures, and in this picture, this is represented by the yellow portion that's really right above the bill, but also it's in between the bill and the eye. That's called the lure. It's a very small area. And then we have an eye ring. And just to be sure, clear, this bird does not have an eye ring. An eye ring, as the term indicates, is a different color around the eye. This one is just exactly the same as, as the rest of the, its body. There's no distinctive eye ring. Usually the eye rings are white. And we have an eye stripe. This bird does have an eye stripe. It's a black line going from the eye to the back of its head. Um, and that's about it for anatomy. Now, another important thing to keep in mind when trying to identify birds is size. And size is relative. So it's really great when you have just kind of a scale so that when you see a bird, you can put it in certain categories. Um, in this diagram, we have four categories. So a bird can be sparrow-sized, which is the leftmost category, and that's, you know, most commonly little sparrows. Uh, birds can be robin-sized, and that's slightly bigger. Um, and just for reference, uh, you know, a sparrow can probably fit in one palm of your hand. A robin, might, might, it might take both palms of your hand to fit a robin in there. This is just for, for your reference. The third category is crows. They are, they are large. And lastly, we have geese. So a goose-sized bird is, is definitely, uh, that would definitely not be a common backyard bird, but you never know. I never know what type of backyard you have. So definitely focus on the first three size categories. All right, let's talk about year-round residents. Those are the ones that are here throughout the winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, American robins are quite fascinating. So they have a reddish breast and belly, black and gray head and back, and a yellow bill. They have increased activity at the very early signs of spring. And if you look closely at them, the females have a slightly lighter colored head. So the females have a rather gray head as opposed to the males who have a black head. They can produce three successful broods in one year. They eat worms and the sound they make is a whistle. Let's listen to that whistle. So as you just heard, robins have a repetition of whistles back to back. Let's move on to the next one, the northern cardinal. They are a little smaller than a robin, but still larger than a sparrow. They have black lures, remember the, the lures, the area between the bill and the eye, and they also have a black throat. The males are crimson red, and the females are brownish uh, with, a, with reddish wings and a slightly reddish crest. Let's listen to the cardinal. So as you just noticed, they also are qualifying as whistlers, but 
they don't just repeat the same thing. They have kind of a slow introduction and then a very fast ending. And that's very different from the Robin, which is kind of the same throughout the whole thing. Uh, interestingly, uh, both males and females can sing in, for this species. Um, also, they are the Kentucky state bird, of course. They have a very interesting behavior. This is obviously observed for other types of, um, for other species of birds. The male uh, during breeding season will prove to the female that he will be a good father by bringing her a food and feeding her, uh, as you can see in this picture, kind of saying, look, I'll be a good father um, and a good caretaker to their future babies. And as a, a unlike common misconception, those birds do not have teeth, as you can see um, in the uh, UofL logo down here. Um, this, is a, this is an awesome logo, but just be sure, no matter what anyone tells you, um, these birds do not have teeth. All right, the blue jay. This, this bird is crow-sized, so we're talking about a bigger bird than both the robin and the cardinal. Um, they have white breasts and flanks. And they have blue backs with beautiful white and black detail and their wings and tails. They can mimic hawks. I've been tricked by them. Um, if you hear a hawk, make sure that, you know, this is actually a hawk, not a blue jay. They are extremely good at mimicking. Let's listen to what they actually sound like. And keep in mind that unlike the cardinal and the robin that we just heard, the these guys are don't are not whistlers. They screech. So listen to their screech right here. And that was the blue jay screech for you. I'm sure you've heard this sound before, since they're very common in not just a, a, you know, a park, they're also very common in urban areas. Next, we have the European starling. This is another bird that can mimic hawks. Um, they have a yellow bill and beautiful dark purple green iridescent feathers that look amazing in, in the right light. Usually those are found in very large flocks feeding on the ground. Let's listen to what the starling sounds like. This, this very unique sound that you just heard is the European starling, and they've been uh, they've been nicknamed as the beatbox bird because they kind of sound like a beatbox. Um, all right, now the morning dove is uh, overall gray with black spots on its wings. It's um, it's about the size of uh, a robin, maybe slightly larger. Um, they can stockpile, these birds can stockpile seeds in their crop, which is quite fascinating. Uh, let's listen to their song. So 
Now you know why they're called morning doves, M-O-U, and that's because of their song. Their song is sort of a morning song. It's a little sad. And um, not to be confused with the great horned owl that does not rise in pitch at the beginning. The, the great horned owl is uh, constant in, in the, at the same pitch throughout the whole thing. And this one rises in pitch and then drops at the end. The Carolina Wren. This little bird is um, almost the size of a sparrow. They have a rufous or brown back, an orange breast and belly, and a white eyebrow right above the eye. One male can sing the same song 3,000 times in one day. Let's listen to what their song sounds like and try to identify this three syllable phrase that they're saying that can be uh, thought of as they're saying Germany, Germany, or tea kettle, tea kettle. Three syllables. Let's hear that out. Did you hear the three syllables? Let's hear that one last time. Three syllables are being repeated very fast. And try to keep in mind the words Germany, tea kettle, or any word that you feel would help you remember the song. Now for the American goldfinch. Those are brown with black wings for, um, with, for males and females in the winter. They're both kind of the same color. But in the spring, this is what the males look like. They're bright yellow with black wings. You can't miss them. And um, they, these birds also weave their nests. They make a very unique sound while in flight. And this one is um, four syllables, and it sounds like potato chip. I did not make these things up, but that's what has been uh, qualified as a mnemonic for, to remember their songs. Let's listen to that. Nope, that's not the right one. So that was the potato chip flight call for you. And uh, I hope you get to hear that at some point. Next, we have the Carolina chickadee. This one is just as big as a sparrow. They have a black, a black crown and black throat. They have gray wings. And those chickadees will eat 20 times more food in winter than in summer, which I thought was a very fun fact. This bird was named after its song, much like a lot of, of birds you'll notice soon. Uh, chickadee, chickadee dee dee, is the way to remember their calls. Let's listen to that together. And that was the chickadee, chickadee for you. The tufted titmouse is gray and has a gray crest. They have orange flanks and a white breast. They have a, a very uh, tricky alarm call. So 
this is what their call sounds like. Um, before I mention the, their call, uh, regarding the tricky alarm call, uh, would, what's meant by that is that they will, when a, a predator is nearby, they will make their alarm calls extremely high pitched. And what that means is that it will be very, very difficult for the raptor to locate where they are because of the increasing pitch in their alarm calls. So that's one way for them to confuse their predators. Now, moving on to their uh, regular calls, those sound like they're saying, Peter, Peter, Peter. Let's see if you can hear that. So that was Peter, Peter, and it's just a, what that means is just two syllables, uh, two very whistly syllables repeated back to back. It can be Peter, Peter, or whatever word that helps you remember them. And here we have the house sparrows, also called the city sparrows. You'll find them in very urbanized areas or in parking lots of a grocery store. The males have a black throat, and some streaking on the wings. And the females do not have a black throat, but they, they still have the streaking on their wings. Let's listen to what they sound like. So next time you're getting your groceries, try to look for that very classic house sparrow call that I just played. Um, now we're going to talk about the song sparrow. Um, clearly there are many kinds of sparrow, but the house sparrow that we just saw and this one, the song sparrow, are the most common ones and they're the most likely to appear in your backyard if you if you have um, some seeds out. Uh, those, so those song sparrows are very commonly found in urban areas as well. And they have a very distinct breast, uh, dark breast patch in the center that I just highlighted in red. They have a brown eye stripe that you can see on, on next to their eye. And they're the most widespread sparrow in North America. Um, in their song, look for a three-note introduction that is very distinct to that sparrow. So that it might have sounded confusing, but instead of focusing on the jumble that follows, uh, just focus on the three note introductions and then everything else after will become more clear once you uh, understand those three notes and that they belong to the song sparrow. Now we're gonna talk about the house finch. Um, they have, both males and females have breast and belly streaks. And by streaks, it's those uh, dark lines going through their flanks and breasts. The males have a red head 
and they also have a slightly red belly. They have a very bubbly, whistly song uh, that we're just now about to listen to. And that was the house finch. There's no distinct structure or pattern in their song. It's just a very bubbly whistle with, with no clear repetition, like the robin we saw earlier. Now, one of my favorite birds, the white-throated sparrow. This one is, uh, this one has a very distinct song, and once you hear it, you may never forget it. Notice that they have white wing bars and a white throat, hence their name, and they also have yellow lures. They also have a black ice stripe, and they nest on or near the ground. Their song, uh, to me, sounds like, oh, sweet Canada, 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 let me play that for you. So this was the white-throated sparrow, and you may not hear them right now, but hopefully by next, or very early spring, you'll be able to hear this very sweet, oh sweet Canada, Canada song. All right, it's time for some quizzes, and I'm so excited for you guys to contribute. Now, before I show you the picture of the bird, uh, be sure to type your answers in the Q&A portion, and Maddie, well, let me know how you did. So, what is this bird? And we saw this earlier. I'll give you a few seconds to think about it, type it out, and then I'll give you the right answer. So hopefully everyone is pouring into the Q&A uh, section. Maddie, how are we doing? Get a couple more, wait a couple more uh, minutes. They're still coming in. Awesome. They're not minutes, seconds. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so if you're still unsure, uh, remember the black uh, crown and the black throat are distinctive of... All right, the... Uh... The majority answer is chickadee. Were they correct? Yes. Awesome. I am so proud. All <laughs> right. Now let's do one more quiz before we continue the rest of our common backyard birds. This one is an audio quiz. So get ready. Of course, this was the Carolina chickadee. Now get ready for your audio quiz that I'm about to play right now. All right, here we go. And that's it. I'm sure you all have it figured out. And if you, you are unsure, think about the quality of the sound. Was it a whistle? Was it a screech? What kind of type of sound did you hear? How are we doing this time so far, Maddie? I guessed um, Blue Jay because I remember you saying it sounded kind of like a hawk and everyone else who submitted also agreed with me. Wow, awesome. And just to be clarify, the hawk sound sounds completely different. 
this is the actual true blue jay screech and when they do mimic a hawk you will not be able <laughs> to tell the difference between uh, them and a hawk um, so this was the blue jay screech moving on um, of course this was the blue jay and there's a picture for you moving on we're going to talk about a few spring visitors um, first one is the indigo bunting uh, first of all let me point out that they they these these birds the indigo buntings and including some other birds as well they can migrate at night um, which I found pretty fascinating. And um, the males, as you can see on the left, are bright blue, while the females are just very uh, simply all, all around brown birds. Let's listen to um, what they sound like. Might need a little minute for this one. All right, here's the indigo bunting. Before I continue playing the indigo bunting, notice this time how it's a series of uh, repeated notes and every note is repeated twice so it's two 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 all right that was it for the indigo bunting. And by now, I'm pretty sure you're like, well, what's up with all these little brown birds? We saw so many of them and it's so confusing. Um, what are we going to do to identify them? Well, I'm going to try and give you some easy tricks on how to tell these little brown, not very distinct birds. And just be careful, the birds that are going to, I'm going to talk about in this next se section are seed eating birds. The Carolina wren, I guess, can be considered a little brown birds, but they feed mostly on insects and are somewhat, somewhat more reddish in color rather than just brown. And if you observe them long enough, you'll learn that they have very, uh, very dance like quick movements that no other birds in this presentation can really do. There can absolutely be other little brown birds coming through your feeder, but we're just going to talk about the most common ones here. So, first of all, does it have a black throat? If the answer is yes, then for sure, that's a house sparrow male. Now, the next question you should ask yourself, well, does it have a white throat instead? If yes, then that's a white-throated sparrow. You've already, with these questions, you already eliminated all the other options. Lastly, does it have a red head and breast in addition to its other brownish colors? If the answer is yes to that, then it's a house finch male, most likely. If the answer is no to all of these questions, then you move on to the next questions which are looking at the streaks on the breast. So if they don't have any streaks on the breast, then it, it's either an indigo bunting female or house sparrow female. How do you tell the difference between the two? Look at their backs. Notice how the indigo bunting female has a very plain brown back and the house sparrow female has a lot of different interesting color like black and light brown on there. So the back is streaked. And both of them, as I just mentioned, has have a plain belly with no streaks on their bellies and breasts, no lines. Now, if the bird does have lines, so the answer is yes, 
then look at these two birds. It can be either a house finch female. So remember the male counterpart of that species had that reddish, very distinct head and breast. So the house finch female is just brown with brown streakings on the breast. And then you have the song sparrow that looks extremely similar. So how do you tell the difference between these two? And notice that the song sparrow is, you know, we're looking at it from the side. So you can't even see that dark brown, that dark, almost black breast, uh, sorry, very dark spot in the center of their breast. So how do you do that from the side view? Look at their heads. Does the bird have a dark stripe on their crown and going through their eyes? If the answer is no, then that's the house finch female. The head is very similar to the entire, the entire of rest of the body. If the answer is yes, so notice the song sparrow's head and the little dark brown lines going on top of its head and through its eye, then that's it. That's your song sparrow. I hope this was helpful in identifying very difficult small birds. And you can do this uh, with your binoculars. You can also uh, try to do this from your window. You can get close enough sometimes to really look at these very distinctive features. Next, we have the rose-breasted grosbeak. And you might ask why I didn't include the rose-breasted female on the right in my little brown bird showroom. Well, you can quickly tell that it's not one of these little brown bird by looking at the very large pink bill and also the white eyebrow that none of the other birds have as distinctly. Um, and obviously the male is very characteristic, very easy to identify. It's all black and has a rose uh, breasted patch. Those birds have been, uh, they've been described as a robin that took singing, professional singing lessons. So it's a whistle, there's repetition, but the quality is just so, so deep and interesting. As I just mentioned, this might have sounded just like a robin to you, but think about the quality and how much more refined it sounds. And that's the rose-breasted grosbeak for you. The males, interestingly, share the incubation duties with the female. What's incubation? That's simply sitting on the eggs after um, successful breeding. Now we have the common grackle. They have an iridescent blue head, a brown slash bronze body, and they have very beautiful yellow eyes. Um, you thought scarecrows are used to scare away crows? Well, think again, because grackles are actually the top cornfield eater. So, I think the main goal is to get, get crackles to eat a little less corn from farmers' crops. And they uh, sound like a very uh, rusty gate. Let's listen to that rusty gate sound. Hopefully that was extremely unique compared to all the other sounds we heard. And to remember the common grackle, think about that rusty gate that is a little bit reminding of their rusty colors. This one is the Eastern Bluebird. This one might not show up in your backyard without some encouragement. They might need a Bluebird box. Um, they have a blue head and wings, brown and rufous breast and flanks, and a white belly. 
they feed on insects and they sound like this. And here we're going to talk about the ruby-throated hummingbird. This is the most common, almost exclusive uh, hummingbird in Kentucky. If you put out um, sugar water, not dyed sugar water, they will probably come to your backyard. Um, as you just saw earlier, I showed on the left this picture of a male with this beautiful red throat. Uh, I just want to tell you that you will not it's not very uh, common to see the red throat because it just requires that perfect angle and perfect light. You'll most likely see it looking like this. It looks dark, but not exactly red. That's because those feathers are iridescent. And on the right, you have the female. She does not have a, a colored throat, but is nevertheless just as beautiful. And those little guys use spider silk when they weave their nests to allow for some elasticity. And this is what they sound like. And if you're more, if you're very interested in hummingbirds, uh, please feel free to visit the Paul Sawyer Public Library YouTube channel to watch a presentation just about hummingbirds and how to attract them. This concludes our bird ID workshop, and I have two more quizzes for you. Um, let, let's see if you can recognize this bird. And don't forget to type your answers in the Q&A section. That's the little uh, question mark symbol at the top of your screen or, or you, on your device. What's the status, Maddie? The overwhelming answer is indigo bunting. Yay, awesome. I'm again, very proud. That was correct. The next quiz here, um, and I'm gonna do it real quickly to allow time for questions, is an audio quiz. Let's see if you can identify the sound. So what do you think this bird is? Type it in the Q&A section. Maddie, what do you think this bird is? And I'll, I'll give you a little bit to think about it and give a chance for people to answer. Do you want me to say it now or still give people a chance to answer? How many people have responded so far approximately? About, about the the maximum that we've been getting. Okay, well, go for it. Common grackle. Yes, you are correct. <laughs> That's it. And you've been an excellent student, along with everybody else who's been watching this presentation. I'm so, so thankful that I've been able to help you in any way or teach you something meaningful. Uh, to close off, I wanna acknowledge the credits, all audio and pictures have been used uh, for educational purposes from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, allaboutbirds.org and or from the audubon.org uh, bird guides. 
available online by the National Audubon Society. There are some interesting online resources for you. Uh, if you really feel uh, you need more challenges and want to test yourself, please go visit the birdingquiz.com slash bird test. It has quizzes by category and difficulties. And also feel free to check out these posters that are available online and follow us, uh, Frankfurt Audubon Society on Facebook to hear about more bird related events. All right, Maddie, are there any questions for me? Yes, we have a few questions, but I first just want to say thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Um, I have spent a lot of time with Noor and I'm still trying to learn bir birds and um, she uh, she has just given me a lot of knowledge um, and experience. I'm super grateful for that. And this was a very helpful pr presentation. I chuckled at the the little brown bird things because <laughs> those are the ones I usually give up on. I'm like, eh, it's yeah. a little brown bird. Um, so with that, uh, we have a few questions. How many eggs or young are typically in one brood or does it vary by species? Oh, it, it definitely varies by species. I can definitely answer that. And um, for example, in robins, it's um, three to four, if I'm uh, remembering correctly. And again, as I mentioned before, they do that. They do those three to four eggs. They can do that three times during a season. So a total of about 12 eggs produced in total for a whole season, which is really wild. Um, but it definitely varies by species. And I don't know all of them for every single species. All right, um, next we have, how can you tell a female blue jay from a male? Is it the same as a chickadee? That difference? Uh, well, so first of all, there there isn't a difference in chickadees. Maybe they meant to say something else. But for chickadees, Carolina chickadees, there isn't a difference, and there isn't a difference for blue jays either. They both, uh, males and females, they look the same. So At least, well, let me add, add to that. <laughs> yeah, visually you can't tell. Um, and or let me add that at least to our eyes, they look the same. There's been some very interesting studies um, with UV lights that shows that depending on you know the bird's eyesight, they can see colors that we can't. And sometimes some birds have coloration that varies between males and females, but that we cannot see uh, given our visible spectrum. That is fascinating. Um, yeah. What is a crop on a bird? I believe you mentioned that earlier. Um, yeah, the crop is basically the almost equivalent of a stomach. Um, and so when they're feeding, the crop gets enlarged because that's where the food is. Uh, the, in, the difference between the stomach and a crop is that the crop can be used to get food out to the, the, the young. So it's not like a one-way um, route. It can be uh, expelled to feed the, the young. That's, that's what the crop is. And it's in their neck, correct? Yeah, like yeah. It's like, it's like, I don't know exactly, but yes, it's, it's in their digestive system. So yeah, after the neck, after the esophagus is the correct term. <laughs> um, awesome. And then our last question is, how do you tell Finches from sparrows, is there a distinct characteristic to tell the difference between the two groups? Yes, so the most distinct characteristic, if, you, if you're not gonna go through our little diagram, is the bill. Sparrows have a very thin, delicate bill, and the finches have a slightly bigger, thicker bill that's better equipped for like, larger seeds. Um, so definitely look at the bill. If you're not going to look at any other features that we talked about that are easier, um, definitely look at the bill. That's a very important feature in differentiating them. So sparrow, again, sparrows have a very thin, delicate bill and finches have a larger bill. 
it's just thicker. And I can go back to um, one of my slides with the finches. So just to compare, um, actually check out, no, not this one. Check out, almost there. Okay. So it's it's a little more difficult to see, but you know, look at the sparrow and its bill, and then compare that with the much thicker bill of the finch. So that's one one example. But if you're not going to rely on the bill, definitely rely on the rest of the body, and uh, look for look at the breasts and belly. So as you can see, finches have streaked flanks and bellies, and uh, well, some sparrows have plain bellies, and some sparrows have streaks as well, but the streaks are not as marked and all over as much as in the finches. Hopefully that answers your question. That was great. Yeah, th those are tough. Um, the bill, I could see the difference a little bit in between in the bill, so um, that was helpful. Um, but we are wrapping up on um, 7.30. We want to respect everyone's time. So if you have any last minute questions, go ahead and throw those um, in your questions boxes now. I just threw a bunch of links in the chat. Hopefully you all can see. Um, this is a new platform. <laughs> I don't know how this quite works yet. But um, uh, the first one is the Google Form sign up link to our other presentations this week. We have two more remaining. Um, tomorrow and Thursday. The second link is to our Facebook page. A lot of our announcements, whether it comes to webinars or you know in-person outreach events or volunteer events will be announced on our Facebook page. And lastly is our YouTube channel. All the presentations from this week, um, if you're not able to make it, if you had difficulties accessing it, will be made available on our YouTube page um, sometime in the near future. There's a lot of editing and stuff that um, I have to do. But if you go to our YouTube page, you can subscribe to it and you will get a notification anytime a new, um, a new video is up. Okay, I have one more question that just popped up while I was rambling. And mm -hmm. it is, what is the coolest or most memorable bird that you've seen in Kentucky Nor? Uh, that's an awesome question. There's so many. Uh, I think that recently I, this is not a backyard bird, but I recently uh, in last May, I went to see bobolinks at Camp Nelson National Monument. These are birds that are very loud, very noisy, and they do this amazing display where they fly over their grassland territory and then dive back down at, at the end. So it was a spectacle for sure. That's awesome. I, I remember um, hearing about that and actually going to Camp Nelson myself and seeing that not knowing what it was and i asked you about it later <laughs> you were thrilled <laughs> but um yeah i never uh, i can never get enough excuses to talk about birds so yeah <laughs> well thank, thank you, you for, yeah for coming and uh and spending this evening with us and um giving out some really good tips for identifying um some common bird species so Thanks again, Noor, and thanks everyone for joining. Again, there are two more presentations tomorrow and Thursday, and you can find them in the first link that I sent in the chat. So I hope you all enjoy. Bye, everyone. Bye.